Um, welcome everyone to the Kappa Open City Symposium, Equity and Planning and Design for a Neighborhood Under Neglect. My name is Ju Wan Im, Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture, and this is Dennis Kiesa, Assistant Professor of Architecture. This symposium is a collaborative effort among our disciplines in the College of Architecture, Planning and Public Affairs at UTA. We want to thank everyone that made this possible. This has been a year long planning process that was only possible with the help of many people. Uh, first, we wanna thank our directors, uh, Dr. Diane Jones Allen, Director of Landscape Architecture, uh, Professor Brad Bell, Director of the School of Architecture, and Dr. David Corsi, Interim Chair of Planning Affairs and, and Planning. Uh, we want to thank uh, Dr. Adrian Parr, our former Dean, uh, for supporting the symposium through the Kappa Conference and Workshop Grant for the advancement of diversity. And finally, we want to thank uh, the Latinos in Architecture chapter of the AIA Fort Worth and Community, community Des Design Fort Worth for their support. And issues, equity, and planning have long been discussed, yet solutions vary because every community has specific needs and conditions. Um, the recent incidents and death caused by hate crimes and racial discrimination bring our attention to how our built environment can be the catalyst to alleviate these chronic societal problems. And the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex is the fourth largest and fastest growing metropolitan area in the country. Uh, and it's facing issues of displacement, gentrification uh, that affect underrepresented and underserved communities. Uh, attracted by a thriving economy, new urban dwellers are growing in numbers and are collectively applying pressure on cities to provide housing options in the region. As in many other cities, policies that shape neighborhoods and cities continue to incentivize developers instead of community building. Uh, this often uh, leads to profit-driven development uh, that perpetuates historic, historical inequities and injustices that result in segregated communities. So we are here to discuss and learn how we can promote the integration of equity in the processes of planning and design for the residents in underinvested communities. The difficulties faced by these communities as well as the reasons for these difficulties demand an honest dialogue amongst policymakers, designers, planners, scholars, students, and members of such communities. It is through a multidisciplinary lens that the Open City Symposium at Kappa aims to bring the issues to the table publicly and seeks optimal measures to achieve equity in the built environment. So thank you everyone who came to the symposium today to listen, learn, discuss, and find solutions together. And now, uh, if you would please help me welcome uh, uh, the Dean of the College of Architectural Planning and Public Affairs, Dr. Maria Martinez Cosio, uh, and she's gonna say some remarks. Maria. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis and Juwan for allowing me to participate. Um, so the teacher in me um, has to do a PowerPoint because I think that, I don't know if you all had a chance to hear this morning's session where the students presented um, on the Polytechnic Heights project that they've been working on. And it's just, it was so exciting and so good and on so many levels. And, and I'm hoping that just my welcoming comments sort of help to frame some of the questions that I think we all wrestle with as we engage um, with communities um, that are underserved. So let me just share this real quick and I will try to stay you on within my time. Um, let's see, can you guys see the presentation here? And I'm gonna yeah. start from the start. So um, again, my thanks to Dennis and Juwan. I think they've done a phenomenal job um, through this project this year. Um, I think for, in, in terms of thinking, I'm an urban sociologist, and I'm ter in terms of thinking about communities of color, and you know, I've done work with um, engaging communities of color for about 20 years. Um, I think we all are, are, it's good for me to see, particularly in the project this morning, how our students are understanding how difficult and laborious that process is of engaging, engaging communities um, in, in uh, thinking about the spaces that they use. And I wanted just to show a couple of examples of how difficult this work is, even for large foundations that are very well resourced, um, but also that there's opportunities for us to really work uh, in ways that uh, move us closer to equity. 
So one of the examples um, that I work with is uh, California Endowment in, in uh, you know, they're all over California, but the office that I work with is in San Diego. The endowment has about $3 billion in assets. They have a ton of money and they've worked to partner with communities around health issues. Uh, and part of that is an impacting policy. They want to engage residents to understand how processes work so they can, they can then ask for those kinds of changes that they want for their communities, right? Um, as they move through various projects, um, the last one was a, an empowerment project where they work with 10 communities. Each one got about a million dollars to um, and to basically develop the plans that they envisioned for improving their community. One of the areas that um, I was really fascinated with in terms of understanding, right, community engagement was a group of women from Eritre Eritrea, forgive my, my pronunciation there. So these women um, went to the foundation and asked for some funds to create their own sort of it was really a community group that they, they weren't yet at the nonprofit stage, but they wanted um, resources so they could start bringing all of these women together around mental health issues. Um, the interesting part to me is that a lot of the foundation, a lot of the nonprofits in the community were really opposed to this because they saw these women as not having experience in running a nonprofit as as not, um, you know, that the, uh, the services were already provided by other by other nonprofits in the in the neighborhood, and um, the, you know, in some ways, I think that I was surprised by that opposition. Right, I thought the more the merrier. Let's welcome them in. The foundation gave them the money, and um, they are now just this formidable group of refugee women that use everything from cooking classes to bridge divides, um, but also to engage um, you know, refugees in basically creating that space where they can thrive. Now, some of them have actually run now for the town council in City Heights and have been elected. So they're really now involved in some of the decision-making um, forums. Um, so again, community engagement can take some different forms. And I think we need to be cognizant of how we're facilitating, but sometimes maybe we're getting in the way, right? The other example, a really quick one that I wanted to provide is around the issue of translation. So language is a really powerful tool in communicating with these communities that we engage with. Um, and our efforts to provide trans translation sometimes can lead to additional exclusions. Um, and to try to illustrate this dynamic for one of my, my graduate courses, um, we engaged in a project in Arlington with an apartment building where um, Child uh, protect, Protective Services had talked, ha had wanted to target and develop connections among families with young children in this complex because they were getting, you know, they were concerned about the number of calls to Child Protective Services. So, so we went in, um, started meeting with community volunteers in this complex. Many of them were Spanish speaking. And you know, uh, one of our first meetings where we actually pulled in a larger group, um, we decided to hold the meeting in Spanish rather than English. So we provided the meeting in Spanish so that the residents could actively participate. And we provided translation from Spanish to English to my students. Um, part of this was I wanted them to experience that dynamic, right, of how do you fully engage when you have to wait for that translation to come through. And, you know, and that's exactly what, uh, what happened, right? Um, we had a terrific meeting. The, the residents were engaged. They had lots of good ideas. You know, we developed sort of a proposal. My students um, sitting in the back with a translator um, were very quiet. And as we debrief later, you know, they, they shared how frustrating it was for them that when they wanted to engage, they had to wait for the translator first to explain what was happening. And then they had to try to post their question. But by the time that happened, that communication had already moved on, right? And so I, I think it helped them become much more cognizant of, of these differences that sometimes we privilege, right? We, we run meetings in English. We want the big, you know, kind of town council meetings. Um, how does that impact true engagement by the residents that we seek to serve? So I think we're doing good work in these areas, you know, and, and I think by the awards that some of our faculty are engaged in, by the work that we're doing in poly, I think CAP is really um, trying to make uh, a change in terms of those dynamics and exploring these power differences. So I'm just really proud of our college and the work that we're doing in these areas. 
Um, in the couple minutes that I have left, I'm just going to leave you with some of those issues and questions because, again, I think this is a fascinating topic and I'm really looking forward to this afternoon. But um, I need to put in a plug for a couple of our new programs that we just launched. Um, we have a new uh, Bachelor of Science in Sustainable Urban Design. Uh, it's only the sixth one here in the United States. It's on our website. Um, I would encourage you to kind of share it, you know, if you have either students or colleagues or folks that you think might be interested in understanding um, kind of this cross section of disciplines around sustainability. Um, it's a really interesting curriculum. So I would encourage you to go to the website and look at it. Um, the other one is our master's in sustainable building technology that again crosses disciplines, but also really engages right with the building trades. So thinking about um, how do you continue to develop a skill level that uh, responds to our changing uh, dynamics in our communities that we serve. Um, I think this is just a terrific degree. So again, uh, I encourage you to change to to look at it in our website. And with that, I think I probably went over my time, but I'm just thrilled to be um, the interim dean in Kappa. Um, I'm available if any of you want to reach out and chat about any ideas or projects or suggestions. I'm all ear. So thank you very much for for the time, Joanna and Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Martinez Castillo. Um, this time, please welcome the Director of Architecture, Brad, uh, Professor Brett Bell, the Director of Landscape Architecture, Dr. Diane Jones Allen, and Interim Chair of Public Affairs and Planning, Dr. David Corsi. Brett, you can start. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, Tough act to follow, uh, to follow uh, Interim Dean Cosio there. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. And, and obviously I missed the memo about even having the right backdrop. So I'm somewhere in the clouds here. So um, you'll have to forgive me, but uh, uh, I just wanna start by uh, celebrating the fact uh, that we've made it to the starting line uh, in terms of the actual symposium. Uh, a year ago, when uh, we started talking about uh, the, the, the next iteration of uh, the Open City Symposium. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of that uh, brings together uh, planning for the logistics that go into that, uh, you know, production and um, especially in the midst of a pandemic. And um, I just want to start off by saying uh, congratulations to, to Juan and Dennis for a tremendous amount of work uh, that's gone into getting us to this point, especially amidst all the things that have been going on and um, wanna celebrate the fact that uh, so far, it's been wonderful to see uh, the, the work that has come out of the, the studios that has uh, been taking place so far this year and uh, the, the lectures. And uh, I think it's, it's wonderful that we've gotten to this point uh, and uh, want to commend uh, the work that you've done. And I also want to just acknowledge uh, our, our previous Dean, Adrian Parr, for her support for this symposium and uh, the current interim Dean, uh, Maria Martinez Cosio, for your enthusiastic support for this. Um, I think, you know, when I've been talking to folks, uh, I'm a strong advocate for the various disciplines within our college. Uh, I think we're, we're strengthened by understanding how our disciplines work both uh, within the academic structure, but certainly within the way that we connect out to our community and our profession. But I am uh, most encouraged by these particular moments where the, the lines are blurred, where we come together and we're able to interact and we're able to understand the kind of a way in which we move across our disciplines and we're strengthened by uh, our dialogue uh, with each other, uh, with our community partners, uh, with our other colleagues uh, across the country. Uh, and for me, these are really exciting and important moments uh, in the, the kind of early stages of our college. So um, I'm really, really excited uh, to be a part of uh, the symposium. As I reflect back uh, again on the past year, lots happened, and uh, you know a lot has been made of the differences, and maybe even of the similarities uh, that have uh, been a part of what has uh, either brought us together or driven us apart. And um, I think you know as we've gone through different exercises and asked a lot of questions about what these things are, um, I can appreciate that. Uh, 
this has been in some ways, uh, uh, you know, the, the fixation of an academic exercise or could be that uh, and could be bound within, uh, you know, the contents of a symposium that uh, resides within the kind of the ivory tower. But I'm also struck by the fact that we're in a kind of different era than we were a decade ago where uh, we're actually out in the community in a way that we've never been before, right? And we're asking follow-up questions of, of why uh, are these differences and, and maybe even some of the similarities now more important than ever? And uh, where are these impacting uh, our communities uh, in ways that they haven't been before? And, and what can we do about that? And, and what role do we play um, in terms of uh, offering some insight or just listening and, and supporting in ways that we haven't before? And so uh, for me, uh, you know, the work that uh, I saw this morning in terms of the Poly Heights Master Plan or uh, even some of the, the discussions that have been going on over the course of preparation for the symposium uh, certainly alludes to the fact that uh, I think uh, an era of new partnership uh, and, and discussion uh, certainly uh, brings us to an opportunity to uh, really, I think, uh, point towards uh, some really amazing uh, outcomes and uh, couldn't be uh, more, uh, I think, uh, happy to be uh, a part of not only the college, but some uh, uh, something like this in terms of the events. So thank you very much. And I uh, really uh, look forward to the, the lectures that we're gonna hear in just a few minutes. Thank you, Brad. Diane? Hi, um, I, I won't say much very long because I basically second everything that Brad has <laughs> said and the points that um, our wonderful Dean has um, put forth. So I do want to say just that, um, you know, uh, the concept of the open of the open cities been around a long time. And when Brad and I were kind of thinking about having an annual symposium, and I feel like the success of this year so far, so far really is um, kind of an impetus that we continue to do this symposium every year. And we thought about the, you know, what would it be about? And the open city, you know, concept is really about inclusion that everyone um, has a part. And it really is about, you know, equity and inclusion. And I think that um, the way that Dennis and Juwan and their students have handled this really exemplifies the idea. So I want to, you know, give them kudos of the open city. And these things are difficult because when you do community engagement, especially in the academic realm, you have to think about the students. The students are usually there only for a semester. You, your obligation is that the students learn, but then you have the community. And, um, and so I, uh, so it's really a, a very delicate <laughs> juggle because you know it's kind of a temporary thing for the students but I'm very happy that Dennis and Juwan want to continue um, to commit to the community um, you know using different students and in different format or different ways and then also the thing is that um, even though it is student work student work um, often acts as a catalyst for real work a lot of real you know, student work doesn't um, take away from professional work. It actually often is a catalyst. It's something that communities can use to bring, to be a voice, to bring to their, their, their council person or their cities and to make capital projects and other projects happen. So the work really does have meaning. Um, it is not just an exercise. So again, I wanna um, thank the Dean and Brad and David for the support of this program, um, you know, the university so for the support of this. And I wanna thank um, uh, Dennis and Juwan who are assistant professors, who to be honest, uh, Brad and I kind of picked them and dropped it in their lap. <laughs> they didn't say, we have a lot of things to do, what are you doing? They just were champions, you know, they embraced it and it, and it shown, so kudos, thank you. Thank you, Diane, David. Yeah. You're muted, David. How long have we been doing this and we, we still can't be trained not to, to, to unmute on? I'm so sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this symposium. Uh, we're very, very happy to have all of you here. 
Uh, I, in many ways, forcing what uh, people before me have said. I, I do want to do a shout out, though, though it's already been done to Jawoon and Dennis for all of their tremendous work on this. It's, it's just a, an amazing job, and we're very, very proud of all the work you're doing. And I know this is supposedly going to be a wonderful success. Within my department, public affairs and planning, of course, the urban environment is a critical component of what we do. You know, uh, we are very, of course, involved in local government management and particularly the effects of public service and improving all of our community. And one of the wonders of CAPA, which Brad alluded to, is this unique synergy we have between design disciplines and policy and administration. This is tremendously exciting for our students, for our faculty, and of course, also for helping and working with the community. And we hope that, and we trust, and we believe that these discussions are critical to the future of not only the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but also improving the lives of other in urban environments, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, for those of you who are particularly interested in this subject, uh, since uh, Maria did a shout out for our new degrees, I want everybody to be aware there's a new social justice and equity speaker and event series that will be starting this fall. And uh, we'll have more information about that in the next couple of months and some of the initial events. And that continues our dedication in CAPA to issues of equity and social justice in the urban environment. With that said, thank you all so much again for being here and let's have a great symposium. Okay, thanks. Thank you to our directors and our uh, Dean. We appreciate that. Thanks. So uh, we are very excited to see all of you here and we sincerely hope that you can enjoy the lectures and the panel discussion at the end. Uh, we will have the keynote speakers, uh, Teddy Cruz and Fana Foreman at one o'clock, so in about eight minutes. Um, and um, in the same meeting, so if, don't, don't log off, just hold tight for a few more minutes and then we'll, we'll, we'll begin. Uh, and um, yeah, so give, give us a few minutes. And Fana and Teddy ha have actually arrived. Hi, Fana. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. It's nice to meet you too, Juwon. And uh, Teddy, and thank you for coming. As, so as we wait for uh, uh, more attendees to show up, uh, I thought we could uh, play some Ornette Coleman, who is a Fort Worth native uh, and um, great musician. So we can wait for a few minutes. <laughs> Um, Fauna, do you want to try your slideshow? Do you want to yes. see if it works? Yes, yes. let me. Let Teddy me will be out. sharing his deck. Oh, okay. Okay. Is this working? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. 
Okay, I think we're about ready. Let me change things to okay. So all right. Welcome. Welcome everyone to our first lecture of the day. Uh, I am Dennis Chiesa, Assistant Professor of Architecture. Uh, we will have time for questions after the lecture. So I'll turn the music off. Uh, please send those questions uh, via chat uh, to me. Uh, and then we will ask you to unmute at the, uh, at the end so you can ask your question. Uh, but send those first to, to me via the chat, please. Now, let me introduce our, our speakers. Uh, Teddy Cruz is a professor of public culture and urbanism in the Department of Visual Arts at the University of California, San Diego. 
He's known internationally for his urban research of the Tijuana-San Diego border, advancing border neighborhoods at, hoods as sites of cultural production from which to rethink urban policy, affordable housing, and public space. Juana Foreman is a professor of political theory and founding director of the Center for on Global Justice at the University of California, San Diego. A theorist of ethics and public culture, her work focuses on human rights, climate justice, border ethics, and equitable urbanization. Together, they are principals in Teddy, Estudio Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman, a research-based practice investigating issues of, of border, informal urbanization, civic infrastructure, and public culture, with a special emphasis, emphasis on Latin American cities. Blurring conventional boundaries between theory and practice uh, and merging the fields of architecture and urbanism, political theory and urban policy, visual arts and public culture. Uh, Teddy and Fauna lead a variety of urban research agendas and, and civic public interventions in the San Diego Tijuana border. Uh, their work has been exhibited widely uh, in cultural venues across the world. Uh, they represented the United States in the 2018 Venice Architectural Biennale. Uh, they have two forthcoming monographs, top down, bottom up, the research and practice of Studio Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman, and the political equator, unwailing citizenship. Uh, and also, I, I'll, I'll just add a personal note. I saw Teddy lecture in Fort Worth when I was a student, uh, must have been 14 or 15 years ago. And, uh, and we, I think I've been trying to get him here ever since. So I'm really excited to, to see the both of you here. Please help me welcome uh, Teddy Cruz and Fauna Foreman. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> so Teddy and I will kind of tag team here. Um, first of all, thanks to Dennis and Juwon uh, for organizing this conference, which isn't easy in remote times. And we are, are honored to be here as one of your keynote speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, So um, we'd like to share our research-based uh, practice with you that's embedded at the San Diego Tijuana border. We see this zone um, as a microcosm of all of the injustices and indignities experienced by vulnerable people across the globe. Political violence, climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego Tijuana has become a lightning rod for American nativism. And although the news cameras are gone, tens of thousands of Central American migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never seems to come, reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance, an infestation, or else they sit in US detention centers as tools of deterrence until recently separated forcibly from their children and exposed to a raging pandemic. It has been particularly devastating in recent years to witness the emotional impact on children, their fear, and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon. This really remains to be seen, but the prospect of more border porosity in the coming period is drawing even more people north with misinformation circulating on social media, conditions here are intensifying every day. And in, you know, climate change will inevitably accelerate these flows in the years to come. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our Southern border are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk North. So global injustice is an intensely local experience here. Against these local atrocities, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall continue to confront and productively circumvent unjust power. Some of this contestation is about sanctuary and protecting people targeted by the state. Some of it is working through the courts, the detention centers and other institutions of power to advocate for people ensnared in the net of political violence. Some of it takes the shape of bottom-up civic agency that exposes and counters unjust power, confronts hateful political narratives, and transgresses boundaries. And much of it arises informally through everyday collective practices of resilience and adaptation in conditions of danger and scarcity. 
Over the years, we have accompanied some of this bottom-up emancipatory transgression and eruption of democratic will in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. In recent years, these struggles have also attracted artists and cultural producers from around the world to engage in gestures of performative protest. We've sometimes been critical of this uptick in ephemeral cultural actions that dip in and out of the conflict. They can be extractive in their processes and their impacts on public consciousness as fleeting as the Instagram posts they generate. You know, what happens the day after the happening? We've never been interested in our practice in decorating the wall or camouflaging the trauma of political violence behind murals. Instead, we advocate for a longer view of resistance a more systemic approach to the drivers of injustice, and more strategic thinking about cultural, institutional, and spatial transformation in the border region. These commitments have culminated in a, pro a project that we'd like to share with you today. The UCSD Community Stations, a network of public spaces located in vulnerable neighborhoods across the border region, where universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and collaborate on research, dialogue, cultural and educational activities, and urban design build projects in the city. The community stations are the field-based arm of our design lab inside the University of California, San Diego. So here we are with our team, our students, and some of our community partners in Tijuana just before COVID-19 hit. We have several core commitments that comprise a community stations model, which we think is highly replicable for universities everywhere. I will introduce these commitments. Teddy will then take you on a tour of the four UCSD community station sites. And then I will conclude with a few words about our programming at the sites and how they link our local border context with sites of conflict across the world. So to begin, we localize the global. We've always resisted the idea that global justice is something that happens out there in the world somewhere. Living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students away to learn about territorial conflict, migration, poverty, and climate justice. We're minutes away from an international border in crisis, and this enables an amazing proximity between campus and field, between theory and practice, what we like to think of as a, a critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, a site of interdependence. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric that's designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation and our future is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, love. These things don't stop at walls. We build trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like sort of flaky university programs that come and go, diagnosing crises, extracting data, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. We're there for the long haul. Relatedly, we decolonize knowledge. We are keenly attuned to power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and are critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem-solving missions. We don't do applied research and we don't do charity. We're not a service learning program. Academic culture is filled with vertical assumptions that we know more, that we are trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. We are committed to horizontal practices of co-production, engaging communities as partners with knowledges and agency. Everybody contributes, everybody learns, and we do things together in the border region that no one could have done on their own. Along these lines, Universities really too often take for granted the resources that communities invest when they partner with us. Time, space, social capital, labor, knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions always need to be validated and compensated. We're really curating two-way flows you know, bringing the inside out and the outside in, really unsiloing our campus. We invite activists and community leaders to teach with us. Ultimately, thinking outside the box, very literally, what it means for a university to commit to diversity, cultivating skills of cultural literacy, empathy, and awesome respect. These are skills best learned in C2. Today's challenges demand 
intersectionality, you know, the academic catchword of, of the moment, but really everything that we do on migration, climate change, environment, health, labor, education, urbanization is refracted through the lens of social transformation. We intersect ways of knowing and doing because social you know, challenges demand it, social change demands it. For us, ultimately, it's about changing hearts and minds, tackling inequality by increasing public knowledge about the roots and springs of injustice and growing connected, civically engaged border communities capable of collective action, advocacy, and productive contestation. Ultimately, we are committed to building a cross-border citizenship culture, a sense of belonging that is defined not by the nation state or the documents in one's pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently, artificially disrupted civic space. Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain a fragmented public here in the border region, that the idea of citizenship divides us rather than unites us. We seek to inspire more inclusive imaginaries of coexistence and cross-border citizenship in this contested territory. Our cultural aspirations are inspired by Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal and a 20th century lineage of civic experimentation and urban pedagogy in Latin America. In contexts of dramatic violence and social fragmentation, cities like Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Bogota and Medellin, Colombia, sought to heal the wounds of history and mobilize a cohesive civic identity through participatory cultural action. The way Antenas Mokus in Bogota, for example, used street mimes, urban games, and theatrical public disruptions to transform urban norms from the bottom up, or the way Medellin transformed urban remainders in the city into forgotten zone, uh, in you know, in forgotten zones in the city, into vibrant civic spaces that prioritized access and education, like Medellin's now legendary library parks, our community stations represent a model of urban co-development between public university and community organizations to co-produce the city and fight the, tre the sort of creeping gentrification of border neighborhoods. Each station is designed, funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus and the community. Finally, we reject conventional strategies of urban beautification that turn our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. We really question the agendas of the creative class and, and pop-ups, which too often accelerate gentrification, appropriate arts and culture for private ends, and ultimately become an apology for the you know, absence of more substantial public investment in the city. We believe public space must become civicized. It's a beautiful concept um, uh, of James Tully, a site of dialogue and contestation and infused with resources and tools to increase public knowledge and community capacity for political environmental action. So now a tour of the UCSD community stations and just a hint about what happens in these spaces. Yes, so for us, uh, urban justice must be a distributive concept requiring not only the redistribution of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges. So we design this reciprocal knowledge infrastructure as both a collaborative educational platform, but also a model for shared urban intervention. We claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university can be leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice, mobilizing cross-border citizenship through cultural action. With our community partners, we have co-developed four uh, community stations, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. I will take you from north to south. The UCSD Earth Lab community station is a partnership uh, with Grand Board San Diego an environmental justice uh, nonprofit located in the low income, primarily black and Latinx neighborhood of Encanto, a community characterized by high unemployment, low educational attainment, food insecurity and cyclical poverty. The station occupies a four acre vacant parcel owned by the San Diego Unified School District who granted the parcel to our partnership to increase educational capacity 
for the eight public schools within walking distance of the site. The goal was to promote circulations between traditional classroom-based learning and outdoor experiential learning. This access to municipal land gave us leverage to assemble a unique cross-sector collaboration between a major research university, a local school district, and a grassroots organization to co-develop public space, placing education at the center of community development. Before COVID-19 hit, 3,000 kids and their families circulated through the Air Club each year. And during the current transition, it continues to operate as an outdoor, socially distanced classroom. Recently, the school district committed capital monies towards a more refined physical resolution for the site for what has be, been so far a largely informal effort. While UCSD will invest in sustainable educational programming, research and management in collaboration with Grantwork, who will steward community participation. Pedagogic zones at the site will be focused on habitat restoration through energy, uh, water, food and community programs all wrapped by indigenous Kumeyaay knowledges and environmental practices. Ultimately, the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station will perform as an open air climate action park designed for environmental education and climate justice. The district has also committed school bond funding for a new climate action design building to anchor the site and as a pilot for post COVID porosity in classroom design. This station will break ground in 2022. Moving south, uh, the UCSD Casa Community Station is a partnership with the nonprofit Casa Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based social service or organization. It is located in the, in the uh, border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest median household income, and worst air quality in San Diego County. The heart of this community station is a beloved historic church that sat for decades in disrepair and which we were able to rescue through this project with our partners. During construction, the building had to be lifted for installing new foundations. During the times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with Tijuana's informal settlements in the distance inspired a sense of hope uh, for the local residents. Um, with the adaptive reuse of this historic building as catalyst, we designed the UCSD Casa Community Station as a double project, a parcel size social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity is flanked by affordable housing. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear strips with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate strategy to mobilize diverse financial streams to fund the different building typologies. Leveraging programmatic investments by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support the educational, cultural, and research programming between the university and the community, Casa Familiar and UCSD secured capital investments by the Park Foundation and Art Place America to build the social service infrastructure. These investments enable Casa Familiar to qualify for a $9 million new markets tax credits development package facilitated by the municipality. Casa Familiar has become an alternative developer of affordable housing for its own community of San Isidro and public space was the detonator. We renovated the historic church into a community theater with an outdoor stage. And this performance space is flanked on one side by a series of a small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar's social programming and on the other side by an open air civic classroom pavilion. This uh, social, educational, and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of affordable housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We never imagined that this choreography of indoor and outdoor spaces would become a community asset during a global pandemic. Ultimately, the project advances a reproducible prototype for small-scale development in low-income neighborhoods where buildings collaborate to transform small lots into housing infrastructures for maximizing social and economic exchanges. 
We completed the construction of this station in February, just before COVID-19 hit and the residents moved in. It's all uh, locked down now, but it is a site built for social proximity. So we look, look forward to begin programming the spaces soon. Affordable housing takes on a different meaning when it is deliberately threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural productivity, synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. This is an integrated social spatial system that is programmed collaboratively between the university and the community. Let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curators, theater script writers, and visual artists uh, who come together periodically to co-produce a play that explores an urgent issue facing the community. And this play is enacted by local youth in the community theater. These artistic productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase public knowledge and for policy transformation. Before uh, moving across the border, allow me to pause for a moment to summarize a couple of concepts and share how the, uh, the processes behind our two San Diego-based stations exemplify several core commitments or building blocks in our practice. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. Housing must be public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into more inclusive and plural environments. Zoning must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. Instead, it should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer's proforma is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amounts to 15% of a project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us architects from becoming developers of our own projects. And by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. So in other words, the sweat equity of architects, cultural producers, and community leaders the economic equity of public university and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels can be bundled, aggregated to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. Truly, this has been our story. So moving across the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal settlement adjacent to the border wall. I will take a few moments to describe this dramatic context. This uh, location is at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego, which is now layered with security infrastructure. At this hotspot, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems and between ecological and political priorities is profound. As we zoom in further, we witness a collision between the estuary and the US, the border wall, and the informality of Laureles Canyon, which is home to 92,000 people. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlements that have sprawled on the slopes. This site sits 30 minutes from our campus and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and extreme poverty in our region. Laureles Canyon is impacted by dump sites, drastic erosion, flooding and landslides, and all of this is exacerbated by the dramatic precipitation fluctuations of climate change. Because Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure to mitigate these impacts, much of the trash, along with tons of sediment, flows upstream 
ending in the estuary in San Diego, contaminating this uh, by regional and um, shared by national assets, which is the estuary. Here, everyone, uh, the border wall, the border wall we, we believe is an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the land, uh, the lands in Laureles Canyon have been lost to irregular urban growth. We have been identifying and bundling on squatted lands in the settlement that are still environmentally rescuable to shape an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. Uh, with our Tijuana-based activist partners, we are curating a coalition of state and municipal agencies, grassroots organizations, and universities on both sides of the, of the wall. And we are now negotiating with the municipality uh, to gain access to the remaining public lands inside the informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce the Tijuana stations is that Laureles Canyon has also been the site where we have uh, advanced our research on informal urbanization. As we have written about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with the urban waste from San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and infrastructure. We have learned a, uh, a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case, uh, in a case study we documented years ago, a metal frame appeared from one day to another in a couple of months, uh, recycled materials began to thread the spaces, and in the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that multinational maquiladoras surrounding these informal settlements typically benefit from easy access to cheap labor. Over the years, we have experimented with factory-made material systems to structurally mediate the recycling of waste. Because Tijuana is a city of multinational factories that prey on cheap labor, we have proposed an ethical loop where factories invest in emergency housing. So here we are inside Mecalux, a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export, adapting its prefabricated systems into structural scaffolds as armatures to support informal housing. We designed a catalog with the factory's engineers to test a variety of prototypes and configurations. The first uh, Mechalux typology is shown here with adapted recycled urban waste from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources must support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first example. Uh, being inside the factory, redirecting its material systems and surplus value to sites of emergency was an important milestone in our research-based based practice. We then uh, worked with our partners uh, to build early applications to demonstrate to the community the adaptability of the system, such as this small bus stop to shelter Laureles workers from the sun. It was important uh, to introduce you briefly to these contextual processes because our two community stations in Tijuana operate within this rich ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations and partnerships. So now uh, to the stations themselves. The UCSD Alacran community station is located in the most rugged, precarious, and polluted sub-basin of the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led by activist pastor economist Gustavo Banda and pastor psychologist Zaida Guillén. With limited resources, they began construction of a refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate on unjust asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. 
So we have now established a long-term relationship, a partnership to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. And we are accelerating production of the Mechalux frames to install them on vernacular post and beam concrete systems into a housing infrastructure. The housing scaffolds will be built first, leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with utilities to support incremental live work configurations. These envelopes are the seeds for an evolving sanctuary neighborhood to be infilled through time by the migrants' residents themselves. We see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating local jobs. In other words, to sustain the construction processes over time, we are designing what we are calling a sanctuary economy. We embed refugee housing in spaces of fabrication, training, small scale economic development. With the support of the Park Foundation, we have assembled a community owned business, the Little Haiti Construction Cooperative with the two library, wood and metal machines and a couple of, a couple of trucks and tractors. The community, the migrant community and our partners will complete construction of the site and remain operational for future construction jobs across the canyon. The UCS Alacran Community Station began construction last summer with seed capital provided by New York based philanthropist Robert Rubin and Stefan Samuel, whose collaboration on this project expands their commitment to the prefabricated social housing logics of post war French architect Jean Prouvé. And finally, our UCSD Divina Community Station. This station is a partnership with Colonos de Divina Providencia, a Tijuana NGO that is rooted in the community of Divina. The nonprofit facilitates a variety of social services, including meals for youth, senior services, medical assistance, and environmental awareness. Using Mechalux parts, the station takes the shape of a flexible scaffold to accommodate a variety of informal programs, including informal markets, cultural events, and a series of multi-level spaces to accommodate a small high school, all curated between our university and our partners. At the Divina Station, we work with community leaders, students, and researchers on social protection from landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing ecological conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's really never too early to begin. We have committed to elevating children here as the cross-border citizens of the future. So our two Tijuana base stations have also advanced important building blocks for our practice, two in particular. For us, uh, the informal, the bottom-up, bottom-up urbanization is not just an aesthetic category, but a praxis, a dynamic set of functional urban operations from below that counter and transgress the imposition of top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. Hospitality is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives, for sure, an essential charitable opening a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not really the appropriate model for building an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality into inclusion. Thinking beyond shelter is the foundation for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures for inclusion. Migrant shelters can be agile for negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. So these are the four UCSD community stations. There's so much more to say about them, about our amazing partners and what we do together in these spaces. While all the stations focus, focus on different issues that reflect the priorities of each neighborhood, they're all richly curated for dialogue, collaborative research, urban pedagogy, participatory design build, and cultural production. They all aspire to increase public knowledge, challenge divisive political narratives, foster solidarity and collective agency, and advance strategies to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation, and environmental calamity. 
Now, these activities often invite encounters with formal institutions of power that govern the border zone. Sometimes these meetings facilitate mutual recognition and cooperation, and sometimes they don't. For us, the goal is less about resolving conflict than about understanding, recognizing, and democratizing it. We see democracy, democracy in the border zone as a fundamentally bottom-up process of exposing and rendering more accessible the complex histories and mechanisms of injustice that are too often hidden within official accounts of who we are in this region. Racist political narratives in the US portray the border as a site of rupture and criminality, but we are committed to generating different stories, counter narratives that are grounded right, in the experiences of those who inhabit this region. We are a region of flows and circulation, shared practices and aspirations, alliances of hearts and minds, regardless of the physical wall that restricts the movement of our bodies. In this sense, the community stations become a cross-border observatory, a platform for constructing what we think of as an elastic civic identity from the bottom up, a sort of cross-border race publica. With our partners, we curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a kind of civic skill the ability to stretch and return between local and more expansive ways of thinking over and again, really to understand one's challenges within broader dynamics and processes, to envision opportunities for solidarity and collective action across walls. Here at the border, the idea of the bioregion, the binational watershed system that Teddy introduced to you earlier, has been a powerful imaginary for activating more elastic civic thinking in the border region. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains that Homeland Security carved into the wall between the Laurelis Canyon and the estuary. We negotiated a permit with US Homeland Security to transform this drain into an official port of entry southbound for 24 hours. They agreed, they were disarmed by our self-description as just artists, as long as Mexican immigration officials were waiting on the other side to stamp our passports. Our convoy was comprised of 300 local activists, residents, representatives from the municipalities of San Diego and Tijuana, and artists and border activists from around the world. We summoned agencies that are typically at odds with one another. And as we moved together southbound under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum through a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports on the other side amplified the most profound interdependencies of our border region. The great insight here was that protecting the vulnerable US estuary demands shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So in this experiment, we went down, you know, under the wall. But sometimes nurturing civic elasticity requires ascending above the familiar. In the early 20th century, Patrick Geddes designed the Camera Obscura in the center of Edinburgh, essentially a five-story observation tower that enabled people to look out across the region and comprehend the environmental systems that organize it. He coined the term regionalism. For Geddes, it was, this was an important act you know, for constructing a civic identity and collective political will. Now, imagine a Mexican child standing along the eastern rim of Laurelis Canyon, hundreds of feet above the, water, above the border wall, right here at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing due west with the vast blue expanse of the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the dense informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house, her school, and experience their proximity to a country that she and her family are not allowed to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost you know, directly beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted into a vast and powerful natural system. 
lifting her eyes, she sees the green expanse of the Tijuana River estuary with its vulnerable wetland habitats and sediment basins there in, in, in brown contrived to catch the northbound flows of waste from her own community. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this photo, she sees downtown San Diego rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all the characters of this contested zone come to life. We witness this moment of recognition again and again over the years among children, our students, policymakers, and even foundation presidents. There are few places on earth, we would argue, where the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But in reality, the conflicts that we experience here locally, you know, between nation and nature, are reproduced again and again along the entire trajectory of the continental border between the US and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos that document precise moments where the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, illustrating powerfully what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. Our Mexus project stretches our elastic civic aspirations to a continental scale. Mexus visualizes the entire border zone without the line. It dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems bisected by the international border. Mexus also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional territory, tribal nations, protected lands, croplands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people, and much more. Ultimately, Mexus counters America's wall-building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale, in community stations programming, this image, Mexus, becomes a provocation for dialogue about a shared bioregional civic identity among Mexicans, Americans, and diverse tribal nations who inhabit this contested space. Now, the final civic stretch, literally, is a visualization project we call the Political Equator which traces an imaginary line from San Diego, Tijuana across the planet, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30 and 38th degrees parallel north. Along this trajectory lie some of the world's most contested and violent you know, thresholds, starting the US-Mexico border at San Diego, Tijuana, which is the most trafficked international border checkpoint in the Western hemisphere, the Strait of Gibraltar and the Mediterranean, the main route from North Africa into, into Fortress Europe, the Israeli-Palestinian border that divides the Middle East, um, you know, emblematized by Israel's 50-year military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, India Kashmir, a site of intense and enduring territorial conflict between Pakistan and India since British partition, the border between North and South Korea, representing decades of intractable Cold War conflict, and ultimately China's accelerating militarization of the South China Sea, along with Taiwan and Hong Kong. Now, visualizing the political equator here in red, alongside the climatic equator below in green, was an astonishing discovery for us, because the ribbon in between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums, its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators are applied to the Pierce Quincuncial projection, you know, from above, the Arctic becomes protagonist, with its melting ice caps detonating hemispheric conflicts through sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability, and human displacement. Ultimately, this collision of nationalism and border building, climate catastrophe, and forced migration is the global injustice trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, that was great. Uh, thank you so much. 
uh, this this is inspiring. Uh, can't believe we didn't have you here before. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, our dean uh, Maria Martinez Cosio has the first question. So Maria, if you would uh, unmute. Well, you didn't have to call me out. <laughs> no, I, fascinating work. I'm a UCSD alum, um, Ravel College, and work with Bud. So I'm just so excited to hear you oh, guys fantastic. present. If he had mentioned a little bit of this, and this is beyond, you know, um, it really, it's phenomenal work. I was curious in terms of working um, with uh, Laureles. And I know in the past, there have been issues with trying to remove residents from those areas, you know, with the Mexican government bringing bulldozers in or, or property owners come in and say, hey, this is my land, you know, and, and sort of removing people and keeping the structures. So I'm curious whether you guys, you know, is, is that area more stable? Uh, do you find that you can create, you know, sort of these permanent structures and, and that there's some guarantee that they'll last, right? That again, um, somebody with other agendas may not come in and, and either remove those folks or just remove structures. Should I? Yeah, so why don't you, why don't you, start? Yeah. you know, in reality, it's an interesting context because uh, different to other places in the world, Mexico, I don't know if to say enjoys uh, a very progressive uh, sort of um, uh, legislature towards, towards squatters. squatters. In fact, there are very important protection systems for squatters that emerged from the Mexican Revolution in the early 20th century uh, that really protected uh, informal settlements, really, from being evicted. So effectively, they cannot be evicted so easily. Uh, and what is interesting is that through that process of protection, through very, again, very progressive uh, agrarian land reforms uh, you know, from the Mexican Revolution, there has been a very interesting process of negotiation whenever mm -hmm. the squatters happen that people really, because they don't have housing, right? They have to go and squat public and uh, sometimes private lands. So the government would have to negotiate with those private owners to purchase those lands in order to protect the squatters. But in that process of the, you know, plan, uh, the planned and the unplanned, the kind of negotiation between the official and the unofficial, there is an interesting economic process by which squatters can negotiate uh, property deeds. And so effectively, sometimes these projects like ours that is bottom up, that are bottom up in collaboration with local communities serve ironically as a kind of compass uh, to really enable, uh, you know, obviously the municipality is not investing, right? So the project emerges as a kind of way of really advancing the reconstitution uh, of those areas, moving effectively from the ephemeral to something a lot more permanent. Um, so, so it's an interesting process uh, through which we are trying to legalize uh, with our community some of their lands, <clears throat> and legitimize their presence really as interesting stewards uh, of how urbanization should develop in the future and during this process to begin advocating for municipal services. So for, you know, for, for right. water services, electricity and so on. So it's, it's an incremental, not too much, but slightly formalizing the informal, but not too much, right? Yeah. Right. Thank you. And, and if I could follow up, so is UCSD's role, uh, you, you guys are conveners in some way, right? In bringing community together, but it sounds to me that there's a, there's a strong advocacy role here as well. Um, and wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, as representatives of a state institution, because, you know, we're sort of in, the, in that same role as a public, uh, publicly funded institution. How do you negotiate those roles as researcher, but also advocate? And, you know, and I know many of our faculty are engaged in that way as well, but wondered if you could talk, talk a little bit about that. You know, when we first set up the Center on Global Justice, which is the campus entity that houses our work, the, we wanted to name it the Center for Global Justice, and the campus said, well, no, you really should, you should, you should name it the Center on Global Justice because we do research, not advocacy, we're researchers, right? And so we've been, you know, we've, we've, we've always understood that changing campus culture around partnership with communities is an important part of our role. And so we've been, you know, we've been working both on campus and off cam campus to change our capacity, you know, to, to do um, this, this kind of work. But, you know, we, to, you know, even when the university gets involved with, you know, advocacy in the city, it's always typically understood as the university coming in in a vertical way to lend its support and sort of leverage um, and, and we've really been trying to change that model again to a, a model of partnership. And universities aren't, 
aren't used to thinking of communities, particularly underserved communities, as partners. They see them as as recipients or as you know objects of study. So it's really a, a, a whole scale um, uh, sort of norms transformation within the university to understand that the university can partner with communities. And yes, we do have networks and social capital that we can actually um, make things happen. But it, it's a new way of understanding how much we at the university need the knowledge and the resources of communities in order to do what we think we're doing when we're advocating. So because we're missing community knowledge. Yes. So effectively, it's a curatorial project that really promotes circulations of knowledges and resources between the communities yeah. and, and the university. So we didn't have time to expand it, but we have received, because we've made the case for this funding, again, here from the Mellon Foundation to in fact fund positions that straddle the campus and the community, that we need the human and social capital to really to be able to mediate and facilitate these flows. And ultimately to bring the intelligence of activists who while might not have the, uh, you know, the, the, the qualifications to teach inside the university, we could bring them to co-teach with us uh, in order to reorganize our research and teaching agendas. And so it really is truly a kind of interpenetration uh, between the community and the university. And obviously it's about intervening in that sort of uh, gap by reconstructing trust because precisely as Fona mentioned, you know, the kind of perpetuating this idea that the university just comes either just a service provision or using communities as an object of analysis have created a lot of mistrust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think that that's something that fundamentally for us is essential today to advance us forward, re teaching, re recuperating, reconstructing the trust between institutions and publics. Great. And so great, Maria, that you know Bud. He's he's our he's our guru when it comes to education, and, and he's yeah. he's a co-founder yeah. uh, okay. of, of of some of these uh, of the stations when yeah. it comes to the programmatic educational component. No, he's amazing. I, I yeah, he's just an amazing amazing person. I'm I'm jealous you guys get to continue to work with him. So and and not only that, he lives a block away from us, so we're actually neighbors in the neighborhood as well. <laughs> so it's wonderful. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Dr. Diane Jones-Allen, uh, Landscape Architecture Director, uh, if we can unmute. Oh, I thought you were gonna read the question, but um, <laughs> it's okay, I'll read it. Um, I just wanted to, um, I, I really um, love your work and I definitely um, believe in transactive engagement. That's all because communities are a lot smarter than we think they are. So it's wonderful what you're doing. Um, uh, so I just wanted to know with um, homeless populations being a real issue in other parts of the United States, you know, from north to south, east to west, um, how can you get municipalities to kind of adapt this idea of informal settlements as opposed to the way we treat the homeless as to either pretend they don't exist, continually build barriers and shift them and shift them and put them in shelters and not, you know, how can we, because they do actually form informal settlements in a way, but we tend to not acknowledge that as they do in other countries. So how do you think we could do that? I mean, for, for Teddy and I, you know, it's really been a question of how to reorient the narrative on public investment. I mean, we're, we're going through a period where, you know, we, we're seeing glimmers of hope right now that there might actually be an investment once again in public goods and public well-being. Um, but for us, it's always been about, you know, thinking about the norms and the, and the belief systems that have convinced people who are actually the victims of this new political economy that their interests align with corporate interests. And what we've seen is a major political demographic shift of you know, the middle of the country, the laboring class of our country align with political interests that are not <laughs> that are not in their best. So we want to reignite a kind of what we what we refer to in our work as a public or civic imagination, where we, you know, we, we shed this allergy that we have to thinking about collective goods. I mean, Ted and I always say, you know, we have to reorient thinking to, to recognize that individual interests don't make sense without a collective fabric of well-being. So, and, and, and COVID in many ways was the, COVID-19 has been the canary in the coal mine for this. Um, 
And even still people were willing to make decisions like not masking and not vaccinating against their own interests because of ideological kind of um, drivers. So, so for us, it's really, it's been a, a question of narrative and priorities. And that begins by not only ourselves as academics or professionals, universities, but policymakers to really engage in the shifting of that narrative because embedded in that shift, there is also operational procedural systems to in fact understand as uh, recently a book that argues for what is called a kind of the dividend of solidarity. That by investing in fact in tackling those issues, we are not only helping those issues through ethical lens, which we must, but also begins to uh, produce a more equitable you know, uh, redistribution of resources and support systems. So we also eventually benefit as well. And so I think there's a shift in consciousness that emer hopefully we're emerging from this public health crisis where we now finally have understood the economic, co the, the cost of austerity and that we need to begin investing in the most precarious and marginalized zones of the city, not in the predictable zones of economic development as we also have become culprits of in the architecture profession and in, in terms of our university and our teaching. So I think to shift our gaze to those sites of emergency is not just because we are gratuitously or being charitable. No, it's a mandate in order to raise the kind of quality of life uh, across. And I think that's, that's an important uh, a, a thing to really uh, reflect on. And, and, and in, in so doing, I think in our practice, and we always invite our students to reflect on this, controversy is our point of departure. Conflict becomes the creative tool, the exposure of the very conditions, the institutional mechanisms, the policies that have perpetuated the crisis, homelessness and beyond, need to be those conditions that produced it, need to be the elements, the materials for architects really, uh, uh, you know, to move us forward. So it's a larger question though, uh, because it would imply demystifying so many things, right? The mythologies of the American dream, uh, trickle down economics, uh, the, 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 the fear of the other, so in a way, our intervention at the border, while emblematic of our work as a site-specific geography, is also a way of operating inland to really engage the conflict across jurisdictions and institutions, hopefully into a model of, um, how would I, we call it, a critical proximity to institutions to negotiate and, 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 and represent some of these issues to transform policy. It's, a law, it's, it's, it's obviously an ambitious uh, uh, goal that all of us have at this moment, but I think we are in a good moment. We want to end by saying we're optimistic uh, as we are witnessing that, uh, you know, a two trillion package right now to invest in public infrastructure, public infrastructure reimagined as a more holistic and integrative. Uh, and uh, by situation. the way, it's not just concrete, it's, it's yeah. uh, reconstructing communities. Yes. So. And architects have a, a really important role. To, let's not shy away from this moment. I mean, architects and urban designers who are thinking about justice in the city need to step up and help, you know, help orient public investment right now to the right kinds of, uh, the right kinds of projects. Otherwise it'll get away from us really fast. And I am landscape architects. <laughs> yes, designers, yeah. Thank you so much. On behalf of uh, Juwan, uh, my colleagues, our students, our college and UTA and Dallas Fort Worth, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all at some other time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Okay. Great conference. Thank you.